Y'all pray for him and encourage him. He's certainly been a blessing to us. Hallelujah. Thank you again, Brother Derek. Um, what a blessing it's been to be with you this weekend. And I trust that what God has sown into our lives this week um, by us being together will just continue to bear fruit in our lives and we will continue to see God um, working here in your church and in this community, in our lives, um, wherever we go. Um, we are to be representatives, ambassadors for Christ and um, bringing the kingdom of God um, to bear wherever we go. So um, what a blessing it's been. What good music we, we've had this week. Give the choir and all the musicians another um, round of applause. Um, I'm glad Jesus never fails, amen? Amen, he's never failed me. And um, he's never in a hurry, but he's always on time. And so um, I'm glad he never fails. I want to thank Brother Jay for um, blessing us with the haven of rest. That was also my dad's favorite hymn. Must be a Smith County thing. Um, but anyway, um, we were talking um, uh, at lunch, and what a great time of fellowship um, we've had this weekend. Um, I believe God would have us... Um, to be encouraged tonight from Hebrews chapter 12. And I just want to read um, the first three verses and just encourage you with this thought, why I can't quit and you can't either. Um, I can't quit. Um, Jesus saved me um, when I was very young. Um, I ain't got over it. Um, he called me to preach when I was 15. Um, I ain't got away from it. Um, can't do anything else, but I'm glad that I get the opportunity um, to share God's word. And so um, let's pick up reading at verse 1. It says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily besets us or ensnares us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Lord Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit that's been so evident and present in these services this weekend. Lord, I thank you for the fire of God, Lord, that consumes us as we present our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. Lord, fill me afresh and anew. Give me power from on high to preach. Lord, give us ears to hear what the Holy Spirit wants to say to us. Lord, for the one that may be in this service about to quit, or they've thought about it, Lord, I pray tonight would be the night. Lord, they are anointed with fresh oil. Lord, they determine in their heart they're not going to quit. They're going to keep on keeping on. All the way to the finish line for you. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The book of Hebrews was written to a group of Hebrew believers who had forsaken everything to follow Jesus. Some had seen Jesus on earth and others had heard eyewitness accounts of his miracles, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. Yet because of persecution, they are about to give up and go back to Judaism and the law. So the book of Hebrews was written to encourage them not to quit because Christ is better than all of that. They were now under a new covenant that was a better covenant with better principles, not based on the keeping of the law, but based on the sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And now they could enter into the Holy of Holies. Each and every believer could enter into the Holy of Holies because of the high priest Jesus that we talked about this morning that 
that passed into the heavens and made all the riches of glory available to us. So the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is the Apostle Paul, is writing to encourage them that Christ is better. He's better than Moses. He's better than the law. He's better than the prophets because there has never been anyone like him. There's never been anyone speak like him, never been anyone to act like him, to do like him, to have the power that he had, and there's never been anyone who can save our souls except him. And so he's encouraging them, don't give up. Do not quit. Don't go back to that old life that before you came to the Messiah, Jesus Christ, but instead you keep on keeping on for him. Tonight I want us to see how we are to live in light of all that Jesus has done until he returns. Now, I believe he is coming quickly. I believe that our salvation is closer now than when we first believed. I believe we are in the last days before Jesus comes. But whether he tarries or a long time or a short time, you and I need to make up our minds tonight that we are going to square our shoulders, that we're going to be the army of the living God, that we're going to be the church that God has called us to be, and we aren't going to quit. We're not turning back in the day of battle. We see that the writer of Hebrews here likens the Christian life to a race, and Paul often did this in all of his letters. To the Corinthians, Paul wrote, they that run in a race run all, but only one receives the prize. So run that you might obtain. To the Galatians, he wrote, you did run well, who did hinder you? To the Philippians, he wrote, having not run in vain, and then he declared that he pressed toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And at the end of his life, he wrote to the young preacher Timothy, his son in the faith, and he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me on on that day, and not to me only, but to all who love his appearing. Hallelujah. Here he is no doubt describing a scene from the ancient Olympic games. He's drawing spiritual comparisons to the Christian life and exhorting them not to quit and to keep running all the way to the end. Even if they might have fallen, even if they might have gotten sidetracked, get back on track and keep on running toward that heavenly prize, toward that Bema seat where Christ the judge is waiting to reward us for our faithful running of the race. As we look at these verses, I'd like to share with you why I can't quit and you can't either. I can't quit until I get home. Now, now if he, he's ready to call me, I'm ready to go. I, I, I'm, and I want to be like one songwriter I heard put it, I want to run my last mile home. I want to be strong at the finish line, not barely limping. I want to run with everything I have every day of my life so that I might win the crown of righteousness. So I can lay back at the feet of Jesus just a little bit of all that he's done for me. Why can I not quit and you can't either because of the cloud of witnesses? He said, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. No, no doubt he is talking about the great cloud of witnesses that he had just described in chapter 11. The great faith chapter that begins with how faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. That great chapter on faith that talks about the heroes of the Old Testament who even though they were looking for the promises to come and the promised lamb that was coming and the Messiah even though they looked for it and didn't quite see it in their lifetime they kept running by faith they kept on going by faith and they saw God do supernatural things through their lives because of their faith in the Messiah that was to come he 
What does this not mean, though, this great cloud of witnesses? It does not mean that the departed saints are sitting around heaven watching what we're doing on earth. Now, they may be aware, I don't know, but that's not what this means. It doesn't mean, certainly doesn't mean that they're wandering earth as ghosts appearing to us. Now, I, I've met some strange people in Baptist churches. <laughs> I was Baptist nine months before I was born. Don't hold that against me. Um, I won't, well, I won't say that. that that's, all right, I was Baptist born, ba Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. But anyway, <laughs> I think some people in churches are already there. But anyway, that's <laughs> another story. But I've met some strange people in church with some strange ideas. Well, my loved one departed and they're now an angel. It's not found in the word of God. I had one guy tell me that his mama appeared to him on the stair steps every night at his house. And she'd been gone a long time. And I said, that ain't your mama. You need to be careful what you're listening to. <laughs> That's not what this means. So what does it mean? It means that the life that they lived by faith is a witness to us in how to live our lives and how to run our race. And when we look at Hebrews chapter 11, we find some wonderful things. We find how by faith Enoch escaped death. He was translated. He had this testimony before he was translated that he pleased God. And he walked with God. And like a Sunday school teacher I had one time t tell me, she said, Enoch was walking with God one day, and he got so far out, God said, you're closer to my house than you are to your house. Let's just go on. Hallelujah. And, and oh, that Jesus would come and say tonight, let's just go on. Amen. Amen that the trumpet might sound and we might be raised and be like him and with him forever. Amen. Enoch escaped death. By faith, Noah built an ark and saved his family. By faith, Abraham fathered many nations, though as good as dead, that even when he is an old and his wife is old and they're past childbearing age, God supernaturally provides the promised seed that through him, the promised seed, the seed of the woman mentioned in Genesis, Jesus Christ the righteous, the son of the living God, would come through that line and through Abraham, all the nations of the earth would be blessed. By faith, Moses forsook Egypt, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to jo enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Let me just say, sin has pleasure, but it's only for a season. But at God's hand, right hand, there is pleasures evermore. Pleasures evermore. You can choose the temporary pleasures of sin or the eternal pleasures of righteousness in God. The choice is yours. We find how by faith Joshua had walls to fall, how Gideon slayed thousands with 300, and David slew a giant with just a sling and a stone. We find that some escaped the, st the sword while others endured hardship, persecution, and became martyrs. We can't quit because, what is he saying? You can't quit. You need to run this race with everything you have all the way to the finish line until you receive the prize because there are people who have come before us, who have lived this life of faith, who have by faith seen God do some wonderful things. By faith they planted churches. By faith they started missionary movements. By faith they lived for God in a difficult time in society. By faith, they didn't quit. By faith, they kept on keeping on. And because you and I have known people that have gone on to glory and are in that great cloud of witnesses, may their life be a testimony to us and an encouragement to us to keep on going. Think of my great granny, who up until a week before she died would go down to the water office in Hendersonville, Tennessee and get a list of every new water cut on in Hendersonville 
and she would sit there for hours. This is back, way back. She, back when we had telephones. Now, some of y'all young people, y'all don't understand this. When we wanted to talk to a girl on the phone, we were lucky if we had a five to 10 foot cord so we could go around, around the door facing into the next room. And there was always a phone in the back room that mama would pick up and listen to what we were saying. That's the day. My great granny would get on her telephone and she would make calls from sun up to sundown, inviting everyone that had moved into the Hendersonville zip code to come to Bible Baptist Church. And she did that until a week before she died. And a week, what happened a week before she died? She fell in her garage, she hit her head and had a stroke, and then she went on to glory. But up until as long as she could, she was always doing something for Jesus. In her younger years, she'd go knock on doors in Hendersonville. Every time a new subdivision went up, she was down there knocking on their door, inviting them to church, telling them about Jesus. I think of godly deacons that, that God has allowed me to work with. I think of Brother Earl Barr, who was a deacon at my first church in Morris, at Morrison Baptist Church in Morrison, Tennessee. And I think about the encouragement that he was to me as a young pastor. I started pastoring there when I was 24 years old. And I, to say I was green w would be an understatement. But those dear people of God put up with me and encouraged me. And every, every October at Pastor Appreciation, Brother Earl Barr would take me down to the J.C. Penney's at the Three Star Mall in McMinnville <laughs> and buy me a new suit of clothes and buy Jenny a new dress. When Andrew came along, Andrew was born there. When he came along, Andrew loved to get dollar bills. Andrew still loves to get dollar bills, by the way. <laughs> And before we left, he packaged up 100 $1 bills and said, this ain't for you, this is for Andrew. <laughs> he took me on my, he paid for me to go on my first mission trip to Brazil. A few weeks ago, he passed on and went to glory. Earl Barr's faithful life and encouragement to me as a young minister of the gospel says I can't quit. The people that have come before us that have built the buildings and, and shed the blood and the sweat and the tears so that this church might be built in this community and that it might stand and it might still be here even through ups and downs, peaks and valleys. Their lives tell us we cannot quit. We have been given an inheritance. We have been, they have passed the baton on to us. So may we run our leg of the race with everything we have, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Hallelujah. They serve as an inspiration for us to keep going, to keep believing, to keep seeking, and to keep trusting. You may be here tonight and you're a skeptic. We are living in the most skeptical generation in American history. They don't trust anything. They've seen too much stuff out of people that were supposed to be something, but that's another story. But they're skeptical. And you may be here tonight as a skeptic, but you had a godly grandmother who prayed for you until the day she died. And, she, and her prayers were not in vain. And you owe it to her to at least study out and seek out the claims of Christianity to see if they're true or not. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, so we can't quit. Because others have gone before us and lived godly lives, not only should we do also, but I got good news, we can do it. You say, well, things are dark out there in the world. Have you not been paying attention to what is now accepted in America? When I read the Bible and I study history, I'm a history teacher, by the way. 
But when I study history, I, I find that we're, we're not much different now than they were in the first century. They were worshiping false gods then, they're worshiping false gods now. They were accepting of deviant practices then, they're accepting of it now. They, they were not for Christianity then, they're not for Christianity now. So it's time that we grow up in the Lord and quit making excuses. And we say, as for me and my house, we're serving the Lord. Hallelujah. We have too many people that have laid down their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Too many martyrs. And the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And we have had too many people give their lives for us to just quit. Because it got too hot for us. Maybe God's allowing happen what's happening to, see, to separate who's real from who's not. Good friend of mine said, COVID didn't split the church, it revealed the church. Revealed the divisions that was already there. And gave the religious an excuse to leave and not come back. I'm not here to preach politics or science, because Lord knows I'll leave that to the scientists. But I'm here to preach Jesus. And I know that Jesus did so much for me that I can't quit. And I know that people have laid their lives down for him. And they prayed for me when I was coming up. They encouraged me. So because of that, I can't quit. I can't quit because of the great cloud of witnesses. I can't quit because of the call. I am called by Jesus. And you are too. Too off, too, for too long in the church, we had this idea, well, the singers are called and the preachers are called. No, every one of us are called. If he had not shown up where we were and the Holy Spirit pointed at our hearts and said, I'm calling you, none of us would be saved tonight. But thank God he called us out of darkness into his glorious light as we sing about. And the call of God is on your life and mine. And because of the call of God, I can't quit. Hallelujah. And he said, because of this, I'm going to lay aside every weight. Olympic athletes would train by tying rocks and pieces of metal to their ankles and run with that on until the time for the big race, and then they would take those hindrances off so that they could run with everything they had. We need to lay aside whatever is hindering us from running this race to completion. Anything hindering you. What, do you, what kind of things, brother? I'm glad you asked. I'll answer it for you. Bad attitudes. Bad attitudes are hindering revival more than adultery and pornography ever will. Gossip. It's last night. I might as well get it off. <laughs> Defeated and depressed spirits. That it's, if they ever walked in faith, it's been years. But because they're not walking in faith, when someone comes in that is walking in faith, they want to talk about them and criticize them because they're a conviction to their life. Lay aside that weight. Lay aside unholy anger. You know, we are mad in most Baptist churches. I'll only preach about the Baptist because that's what I am. Contrary to popular belief. But... We get mad over everything except what matters. We get mad at each other over the color of the carpet and the pews. We get mad at each other over what style of music. We get mad and we split ways over, over non-doctrinal issues. Most church splits have nothing to do with doctrine. The only reason for a church to split is if False doctrine is being preached and it won't be dealt with. Or there's sin in the camp and the church is just taking this laissez-faire attitude that whatever they want to do, that's between them and God. 
No, if, it's, if the book says it's right, it's right. And if the book says it's wrong, it's wrong. I don't care who says. Lay aside your weights. Bad philosophies. Wrong kinds of friends. Abusive relationships. Lay aside those weights. Anything that is hindering you from, from running your race all the way to the finish line and winning the prize, lay it aside. Any place or possession you are holding on to. What would it profit us if we gained the whole world and lost our own soul? Yet we hold on to everything we have with an iron fist, squeezing the life out of it, using what God has given to us as a blessing, because every good and perfect gift comes from above, using it for our own desires instead of using it for the glory of God and saying, God, it, it's not mine anyway. Everything I have is just on loan from you. I'm not the owner. I'm just a steward of what you own. And so if you want to take it away, you can take it away. If you want to give it, you can give it. I'm just going to serve you all the way to the end because that's all I know to do. Hallelujah. Yeah. Lay aside the weights and then lay aside the sin. Lay aside every sin that so easily besets us. That one thing that if Satan can't get you with anything else, you know what it is. He'll get you with that. Lay it aside. It's not worth bringing a reproach on the name of Jesus. If you're lost, it's not worth going to hell over. Lay it aside. Give it up. It'll be worth it all when we see Jesus. Hallelujah. Not only besetting sins, but besieging sins. Sometimes Satan comes in like a flood. Just one thing after another, one temptation after another. But I'm glad that when the enemy comes in like a flood, he's raised up a standard against him. The banner was raised at Calvary, and it's dipped in the blood of the precious Son of God. And in his blood, we are healed. With his stripes, we are healed. We have victory. We have power. We have overcoming faith because of the blood that was shed on Calvary. Hallelujah. The standard has been raised. His banner over us is love. Hallelujah. So lay it aside and look to Jesus and keep on running. Lay hold on eternal life. 1 Timothy 6.12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession among many witnesses. Ephesians 6, 16, above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. 1 John 5, 4, for whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. I have been called to live by faith. Faith, and you have too. It takes no faith. Shouldn't say no. It takes very little faith to live for Jesus when we're in a glorious service like we've been. But when we get out there on Monday morning in this sin cursed world, our feet start getting dirty. We better be going to our closets and praying and letting the water of the word and the living water of the Holy Spirit wash our feet so we can keep on running and keep on walking all the way to the end. Hallelujah. The call of God says I can't quit. The Christ says I can't quit. Looking unto Jesus. Quit looking at everybody else. Look to Jesus. I guarantee you, if you look at me or Brother Derek, Brother Cal long enough, you're going to get disappointed. As good as Brother Cal is, <laughs> we're going to get disappointed. If we look at one another in the four walls of the church long enough, we're going to get disappointed. So quit looking at each other and look to him. Because as, as the singer sang, Jesus never fails. 
Jesus never lets us down. Uh, we, as, as the sisters sang, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging for bread. Jesus always comes through. He's always on time. He is right on time. So keep your eyes on him. Consider him who endured affliction, the scripture says. See him living a miraculous life. See him on the cross dying for your sins. See him rising from the dead and ascending on high. And see him coming again and coming quickly. Live for Jesus. Look to him. Run your race all the way to the end. Keep your eyes on him. Keep your focus on him. Because he's waiting at the end. The writer here is like they're describing this scene. The runners have entered this arena and they're running the last lap. And they're focused, trying to get to the end because down there at the end is where the judge of the race is. He's looking to see if you're running according to the rules. He's looking to see who crosses the finish line first. And just as an Olympic athlete or runner will do, uh, after many years of training, they're trained for this race. They are running with all they have, focused on that one prize, the tape at the end, so that they might stretch forth and be the first to across the finish line. Keep your focus on Jesus. The good news is there's not just one winner in the Christian life. We can all be winners. We can all receive a crown to place back at his feet. We can all hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Because of the Christ who died on the cross and got up from the grave, you can't quit and I can't either. Because of the crown, I can't quit. They would run to the end where the bema was. That's the judgment seat. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account for the deeds we did in our bodies, whether they be good or whether they be evil. Have the deeds we did, were they done for vain glory and selfishness or were they done for the glory of Jesus? Everything done for self is gonna be burned up like wood, hay, and stubble. But what's gonna, what was done for Christ is gonna last. It's gonna come out as gold tried in the fire. Precious and valuable to be offered back to Christ. May we run well. May we run according to the rules. And may we run with all we have. Why? Because one day we're going to enter that great cloud of witnesses. If the Lord tarries, we're going to enter that we're going to enter that great cloud of witnesses and there's going to be generations to come after us that are going to look at the lives we lived. And they're going to determine, is this thing called Christianity something that I want to accept or something that I want to reject? It, it, did it mean anything to them? For some, sadly, they'll say it must not have meant much because they never talked about it. They talked about everything else under the sun except that. They lived for everything else under the sun except that. But for those who are running this race well, they're going to say, hey, I might not have always agreed with everything they did or everything they said to me, but I know one thing. I know they meant business with God, and I know they had a walk with God, and they had a relationship with God, and they didn't just talk about God as some far-off distant being, but they talked about him as one that walked with them and talked with them as friends to friend. They talked about God as having a personal relationship with him. And if there's anything to it, I want what they had. Hallelujah. The crown says, keep on running. I can't quit and you can't either. Because Jesus paid too high a price. Other people have paid too high a price. There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Yes. There's a crown to be won. So will you lay aside the weights? Start living by faith. Lay aside the sin, lay aside the hindrances. 
those things that have gotten you sidetracked, lay them aside, get back on track for God tonight. Get back on track for Jesus. You might be thinking, well, I've blown it. We've all blown it. But there's one that never blew it. And he says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He says, I'll be a friend that sticks closer than a brother. He says, I will be with you all the way to the end of the age. Hallelujah. So get up from where you're at. Quit sitting there sulking, throwing a temper tantrum. Get back in the race for Jesus. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Right now, there's two types of people in this room, saved and lost. Number one, are you saved? Has there been a time and place in your life where you surrendered yourself to the Lordship of Jesus Christ? And if not, why not? Why not do that tonight? Why not call on the name of the Lord and be saved? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have everlasting life. God loved you that much. Jesus loved you that much to go to a cross and take your sin and your shame for you. And it says he did it for the joy that was set before him. He did it with joy and he longs for you to have relationship with him and you to spend forever with him. So tonight, if you'll hear God's voice, don't harden your heart. Call on Jesus and be saved. You can do that right where you're seated. You can call on Jesus. You can tell him, Lord, I want you to forgive me of my sin. I'm turning from it. And I'm surrendering to you as the Lord of my life. And then once you do that, you need to tell others. Brother Derek's here. You need to come tell him. I want to trust Jesus as my Savior, and I want to follow him. You need to follow him and follow Jesus in baptism. If you're settling that issue, you come talk to Brother Derek. Then there's saved people. And among the saved people, there are some that are running well. There are others that have gotten sidetracked. One thing that's great about revival and renewal it's kind of like a restart. So maybe tonight, you just need a restart. 